Now, to get back to one of Marcus Grodi's main points, in order to preserve the faith and maintain the peace in the church, the apostles established apostolic succession. And Grodi thinks that that leads to Roman Catholicism, where there is peace and unity and happiness and continuity and unanimity, and everyone believes the same thing. Well, we all know that's not true. Just look at modern-day Roman Catholicism, and you see nothing but strife and dissent and arguing and accusations against each other. And that's just the PG-rated disputes that are going on within Roman Catholicism. Half of Roman Catholicism thinks Francis is a reformer and the other half thinks he's a heretic. But in the early church, the local congregations were allowed to elect their own bishops and presbyters and do their own thing. And even in the first century, after the apostles, there were disagreements about the right way to do things. And in fact, divergent customs had emerged regarding the celebration of the resurrection. As we have noted in previous episodes, when there was a disagreement between congregations about the right way to celebrate the Lord's Supper, some having learned from Peter and others having learned from John and Philip and the other apostles, disagreements were allowed to stand precisely because individual congregations were allowed to do things their own way based on what they had received from different apostles. Listen to Irenaeus, writing at the end of the second century, explaining that the churches far and wide had developed varying customs and celebrated things differently, and that was okay. Now citing from Eusebius, Church History, Book 5, Chapter 24, Paragraphs 12 to 13, in which he quotes a letter from Irenaeus about the disagreement about how to celebrate the resurrection. For the controversy is not only concerning the day, but also concerning the very manner of the fast. For some think that they should fast one day, others two, yet others more. Some, moreover, count their day as consisting of forty hours, day and night. And this variety in its observance has not originated in our time, but long before in that of our ancestors. It is likely that they did not hold to strict accuracy, and thus formed a custom for their posterity according to their own simplicity and peculiar mode. Yet all of these lived, nonetheless, in peace." And we also live in peace with one another, and the disagreement in regard to the fast confirms the agreement in the faith. Again, that's Eusebius, Church History, Book 5, Chapter 24, Paragraphs 12 to 13, quoting a letter from Irenaeus about the diversity of traditions that had evolved, because congregations were allowed to decide for themselves, and notably, different churches had received varying customs from different apostles, And the early church accepted that everyone wasn't going to do everything exactly the same way. And when Pope Victor of Rome in the second century attempted to use the iron fist to force everyone to do it the same way, everyone else told him that he was wrong. But as regards apostolic succession, as Grodi has pointed out, it is true that the apostles appointed bishops and presbyters and instructed them to select deacons and to appoint successors. But it is also true that Paul warned that apostolic succession was absolutely no guarantee of orthodoxy. Even Grodi knows that. Today, some bishop out there might say something contrary to the teaching of the church. When that happens, that means that that bishop at that point was saying something outside of the teaching of the church. Just listen to Acts 20, verses 28 to 30. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Again, That's the Apostle Paul to the Ephesian elders that he had gathered at Miletus to warn them that apostolic succession was no guarantee of orthodoxy. Marcus Grodi has offered up apostolic succession and the primacy of the bishop as the obvious solution to the diversity of opinions and disagreements among Protestants. And yet we know from the scriptures that apostolic succession, the way Marcus Grodi describes it, was no guarantee against error. After all, Paul several times laments that his own disciples— Hymenaeus, Philetus, and Alexander had run after error. That's 1 Timothy 1.20 and 2 Timothy 2.17. And Peter also warned that there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies. That's 2 Peter 2.1. And we all know the story of Diotrephes in 3 John, someone who had been appointed over a congregation and was no longer even receiving the apostles. 
Paul, Peter, and John acknowledge that even with their system of recruiting, training, and ordaining men to succeed them, deceivers would still arise within the ranks in order to mislead. Now that's something important to think about. Did the apostles establish an infallible system of Episcopal succession? Of course they did not, and they knew they did not, and they warned us that it would not be reliable as a mode of guaranteeing orthodoxy. Otherwise, they would have commended their sheep to the system. Something like, Obey whatever the bishop says, because obeying the bishop is how you go to heaven, and nobody who disobeys the instructions of a bishop can be saved. No, they did not say that. They said basically, despite our most sincere efforts to leave you in good hands, the Holy Spirit has foreseen that the office of bishop will be corrupted by heretics, so you have to hold to the infallible guidance of the scriptures and test those who obtain to the office and try them against the scriptures. When Paul left the Ephesian elders at Miletus, he did not commend them to the system of apostolic succession, but rather commended them to the word of God. Quote, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. That's Acts 20, verse 32. And Peter's last task before departing was not to tell the sheep to place their unwavering trust in the shepherds who might very well attempt to mislead them, but rather to tell them, Be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. That's 2 Peter 3, verses 1 to 2. And sure enough, we find in Revelation that the churches had indeed done what the apostles commanded. Jesus commends the Ephesian church, saying, Thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. That's Revelation 2, 2. And we also find in the early church the practice of removing bishops and presbyters that stumbled into error. For example, we can look at Cyprian of Carthage in the late 3rd century. Roman Catholics appeal to Cyprian's soaring rhetoric on the office of the bishop and the seat of St. Peter and ignore Epistle 63, in which Cyprian implores the congregation of Asure not to follow their bishop into error, but rather to turn the minds of the brethren toward truth. Now citing from Epistle 63, paragraph 4. But if Fortunatianus, either by the blindness induced by the devil forgetful of his crime, or become a minister and servant of the devil for deceiving the brotherhood, shall persevere in this his madness, do you, as far as in you lies, strive, and in this darkness of the rage of the devil, recall the minds of the brethren from error, that they may not easily consent to the madness of another, that they may not make themselves partakers in the crimes of abandoned men, but being sound, Let them maintain the constant tenor of their salvation and of the integrity preserved and guarded by them. Again, that's Cyprian, Epistle 63, paragraph 4. And what of Epistle 67, in which various congregations kicked out their bishops, and Cyprian of Carthage wrote back to them and said that they had done the right thing, not because Cyprian said so, but rather because the scriptures had said so. This statement by Cyprian is abbreviated for the sake of time, but we will provide the link in the show notes. I'm now citing from Epistle 67 of Cyprian. When we had come together, dearly beloved brethren, we read your letters, which according to the integrity of your faith and your fear of God, you wrote to us, that Basilides and Marshall, being stained with the certificates of idolatry and bound with the consciousness of wicked crimes, ought not to hold the episcopate and administer the priesthood of God, and you desired an answer to be written to you again concerning these things. Nevertheless, to this your desire, not so much our counsels as the divine precepts reply, in which it is long since bidden by the voice of heaven and prescribed by the law of God, who and what sort of persons ought to serve at the altar and to celebrate the divine sacrifices. Again, that's Cyprian, Epistle 67. We will return again to Cyprian in the future. But here, the point is simply that when two bishops were kicked out of their office, Cyprian responded that they had done the right thing, not because of tradition and not because of his personal opinion, but because of the divine precepts found in the scriptures prescribed by the law of God. Our point here is simply that neither the scriptures nor the early church taught or believed the integrity of the gospel and the purity of the church could be preserved through a succession of men in the office of bishop. In the end, the purity of the church was upheld not by the bishop, but by the individual congregations being familiar with the scriptures and kicking out bishops who did not uphold orthodoxy. That is a scriptural position, and it was the practice of the early church. And for Marcus Grodi to suggest otherwise is to reveal a deep, abiding ignorance of history.
Okay, let's move on to the next citation from an early church father from Marcus Grodi. This time it is Ignatius of Antioch, who died early in the 2nd century, sometime between 107 and 110 AD. He was a martyr in Rome. Again, here is Marcus Grodi. Let's go to another quote. St. Ignatius of Antioch. Read a little bio bio about St. Ignatius. He was born in Syria around AD 50. In other words, he was born just about 20 years after or so after the death and resurrection of Jesus. He died at Rome, a martyr, between 98 and 117. It's very likely that St. Ignatius may have bumped into Clement when he was possibly traveling to Rome to be martyred. It is with great probability that with his friend St. Polycarp, St. Ignatius was a close acquaintance of the Apostle St. John. And if we include St. Peter, Ignatius was the third bishop of Antioch. The first quote we had was St. Clement of Rome over in Italy, and then now we have St. Ignatius of Antioch way over by the Promised Land, north of Jerusalem. Read his quote from Letter to the Smyrnians. He wrote a number of letters to churches on his way to his martyrdom. He said, you must follow the bishop as Jesus Christ follows the Father and the presbytery as you would the apostles. Reverence the deacons as you would the command of God. Let no one do anything of concern to the church without the bishop. Let that be considered a valid Eucharist, which is celebrated by the bishop or by one whom he appoints. Wherever the bishop appears, let the people be there. Just as wherever Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church. Now, as far as we know, this is the earliest reference to the Catholic Church, the universal church, that there is one church established by Christ that has a hierarchy, as it referenced here, of bishops and presbyters. The word presbyter would become priest. It's those that help the bishops. And it says the necessity of following the bishop, not your own interpretation, not some popular man you see on TV, but you follow those who have received this appointment from the apostles and their successors. Okay, let's think about this. Follow the bishop as Christ follows the Father. Honor the presbytery as the apostles and the deacons as the commandment of God. Just listen to Grodi again. Follow the bishop as Jesus Christ follows the Father and the presbytery as you would the apostles. Reverence the deacons as you would the command of God. Wow, those are pretty strong words, folks. But there was a reason that Ignatius talked this way. And this is not the only letter in which Ignatius actually spoke so highly of the officers of the church. There's a very specific reason for what he said and how he said it, and we're going to come back to that in the next episode. What we want to do when we come back is read through all the letters of Ignatius where he refers to the hierarchy, work through the Gnostic heresy that was spreading throughout Asia Minor, and examine how Ignatius wrote against that particular heresy in all of his letters, and that will help us understand why he was so focused on bishops, deacons, and presbyters, and why he was so focused on the unity of the flesh and the spirit. So we'll leave off there in this episode. We'll come back in the next episode to talk about the conversion of Marcus Grodi. We're going to need the entire hour for that, and we're going to cover a lot more citations from the early church, but we're going to spend a lot of time talking about Ignatius of Antioch and the Gnostic heresy that was spreading throughout Asia Minor that led Ignatius to write the way he did. Without that context, we cannot be truly deep in history and we will be misled by the Roman Catholic interpretation of Ignatius' words. This is Timothy F. Kaufman and you've been listening to The Diving Board. We'll see you next time.